Good morning. Uh, my name's Kel. I'm actually not entirely interesting, so I want to tell you about my grandmother. On Monday, this past Monday, the 3rd, she turned 100 years old. I won't get there, so good for her. So, About 12 years ago, living in Florida, my grandmother, the retired elementary school teacher from Camp Hill, Pennsylvania, had the opportunity to have lunch and play golf with a famous rock star by the name of Vincent Furnier. If you have not heard of Miss Vincent Furnier, it's because he goes by the stage name of Alice Cooper. This really happened. I'm not joking. This is what he does. He flies around, and he, he's a huge golf fanatic, and he likes playing golf with, I guess, people like my grandmother. And, uh, and apparently, he's a very nice guy, and had lunch, and she said, well, Vincent does this, and Vincent told me that. And I said, Vincent? She goes, now, Kel, you know his real name is not Alice. <laughs> I said, OK. And I thought about this quite a bit, uh, probably more than I should have. Um, and, and it occurred to me that my grandmother and Alice Cooper have a lot in common. I, I thought about this quite a bit. They are members of the fastest growing age demographic in the world, people over the age of 65. I'm going to show you a graph. You can't read it. That's OK. I'll tell you what's up there. The y-axis is life expectancy. The higher up the dots go, the longer people are living. It starts at about 40 years and goes up to 90. The x-axis is percentage of healthy years. What do we call healthy? Free of long-term illness, long-term disability. It starts at about, what is that, 79% goes up to about 89%. So the further right we plot, the healthier people are. In 1990, the Global Burden of Disease Commission did a study, and they profiled 246 industrialized countries against this graph. It looked like this. So, OK. What's that mean? Well, it means that in 1990, we could expect to live between, say, 50 and 80 years and have about, uh, I don't know, say, 82 to 88 percent of those years be reasonably healthy. Fine. Fast forward 22 years. They did the study again. It looked a little different. Dots slid up, meaning people are living longer. Dots slid to the left, meaning people aren't necessarily living healthier as they get older. If you live in the United States and if you're a male, you can expect to live 10 years with a disability. If you're female, 13 years. This I also think about quite a bit because I work in this odd kind of cross section of healthcare and technology and accessibility and these things, and my clients span a lot of in the sort of healthcare pharmaceutical space. And I'm always struck by the, the gap between what the potential of technology and what we expect technology to do, um, depending upon what we care about the time that we care about it. Now, that made no sense, so I'm, and so I'm going to give you an example. Uh, last summer, this guy gets into a little metal hut, closes the door. He goes up, 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 up in the sky, 21 miles in the sky, not quite to outer space, but darn close. While he's up there, he opens the door, which is a perfectly sane thing to do, <laughs> looks around, leaps out, goes down, 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 down hits the ground, gets up, walks away. We all watched it live, didn't we? So we can do that, and yet if we had to try to make a capture that a blind person can use, that's impossible almost. <laughs> you would not believe how many discussions I have around this. Can we please make this application accessible to people with disabilities? That's really hard. Can we drop a man from outer space? Sure, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> I know why this happens. Robin Christofferson told The Guardian UK that the reason this happens is because accessibility is traditionally an afterthought, a bolt-on, a nice-to-have. If we have the time, if we have the budget, if we get sued, if Kel doesn't stop talking, right? And, you know, we start to layer up these what-ifs and these contingencies. Accessibility is really ugly. You know, if we do that, it's going it's to depreciate the visual value of it. You know, it's expensive. It costs a lot of money to do that. Um, accessibility is not very marketable. We can't do that. It's not innovative. I, I kind of pause there because I think, you know, I have data against the other three, the first three. I can, I can kind of prove that. I can say if you bring in accessibility earlier in the cycle, you somewhat um, mitigate those first three things. But how do you prove accessibility is innovative? So that's what I'm going to talk about here, hopefully. 
So, and it, it's kind of curious. I saw um, a presentation at the M Summit last year in DC, and Rich Donovan, um, who's a pretty well-known accessibility advocate um, and also a, a very brilliant financial mind, he talked about products like the Hummer and Tang, right? And they come from a need to design for extreme environments. Uh, I personally would never drive a Hummer, and I think Tang is disgusting, but you can't, you can't necessarily um, fault them as consumer innovations because they are innovative. And he says, you know, when we design for these extreme environments, we lead to innovation. That's what innovation really is. But the thing that happens a lot is we tend to think of innovation in terms of gadgets, technology. Remember when the iPad came out? Five years ago. I'm old. Five years ago, the iPad came out. And one thing I've kind of noticed is when a gadget comes out, it does, the hyperbole machine goes into overdrive. Not just Apple, but just anything. You know, it's like it's going to be the greatest thing in the whole world. It's going to change your life. It's going to change how you deal with people and computing and data and this and this. Then you have your backlash. And then, like water, it kind of finds its level, right? And we look back and we think, that was quaint. We used to think that, but now we're, we're better. But the thing is, this happens all the time. What's the new gadget we're all talking about now? Just yell it out. Google Glass, brother. I mean, I tell you, it's going to change everything. You're going to put it on your face, and you're going to do this, and surgeons are going to walk in, and they're going to be able to operate on you without even looking at you because they're going to be doing this. And it's just, <laughs> stop. Just take a breath. Take a breath. This is why I have begun to seek my source of innovation in non-technology areas, such as the slums of Manila. In monsoon season, people live in these corrugated tin huts without electricity, and they can't create fires because it's very dangerous. And there's no electricity because the road technicians who put it in, um, that you had a whole fire thing come up again. So a interesting group called the My Shelter Foundation found a very novel solution to bring light into these people's homes. They filled plastic bottles, recycled plastic bottles with chlorinated water and stuffed them in holes in the roofs. Each of one of these um, bulbs creates the equivalent of 55 watts of natural light. And they've done this in 10,000 homes. And I like this idea of innovation being derived from things around us. I like, if you think of it kind of like a, a forest, which is dark and dirty and chaotic and organic and stuff. And out of all this seeming chaos, a bird builds a nest out of things that it finds in order to ensure its survival. There's a term for this in biology. It's called niche construction. Right? And one thing I've been noticing is that people with disabilities or those who work on behalf of those with disabilities are doing this niche construction in the technology space. They're going through and they're getting Arduino kits. And we live in very much a maker's world, as we all know here. And you know, they're kind of taking Wii game consoles and ripping them apart and making stuff that otherwise wouldn't exist, like this Braille iPhone created by a blind student at the University of Auburn. And you know, it's interesting, because now I'm noticing in the last five or six years of sort of keeping an eye on this, that the consumer I guess marketing product world is starting to catch on to this. And it's interesting that's happening so recently because this isn't new. Uh, those of you who are tweeting this live, you're saying this guy's crazy, oh my god. You know, you may not know that the QWERTY keyboard actually began from the typewriter, which was invented on behalf of a blind person. Right? Pellegrino Turi was in love. He was in love with a blind countess, and he said, It would be wonderful if you would write me letters. And she said, I can't, because I can't see in that quill and pen thing. It doesn't work. So he invented the device so that she could do that, the things we do for love. Um, earlier, uh, before Braille was commonplace, educators got together and tried to figure out a way so that people who are blind could read books. So they had people recite them into um, recordings, which were pressed into thick slabs of wax. These slabs of wax became the 78 RPM vinyl record, which became the 33 and a third RPM vinyl record, became the eight track tape, the cassette recording, the compact disc, the MP3, Pandora, whatever's next. So I'm gonna go through a couple of uh, localized examples. Uh, is this good so far? You enjoying this? No? Oh, good, all right. Well, I like to ask, so. <laughs> so. Uh, well, I live in Philadelphia. Um, Suzanne Erb um, is a, a blind person who is working with some researchers from the University of Pennsylvania. Walking sticks do a great job of detecting obstructions on the ground like this, right? It's not so good for something that's, say, right here, about waist high. Uh, at the bank where I go to in my neighborhood in Glenside, um, I once saw someone nearly crack his skull open, almost tripping over one of those doing this. So they created this little sensor that goes right about halfway up in the walking stick. It detects obstructions about waist high. 
And I like this example because it's, you know, you see all these the, the gears and the duct tape and the wires hanging out the back and stuff, but it works. It works really well. This is a shoe, a sneaker called La Chale. That's Hindi for take me there, invented by a young man named Anirudh Sharma. He took an Arduino lily pad and stuck it in the heel and put vibrating sensors all around the sides and the toe. This picks up obstructions nearby and it's into vibration so you know which way to pivot if you hit that obstruction. It doesn't replace a stick or a working dog, but it does okay. This is Iris Connolly. Uh, she lives in Essex in the UK. She is about, I guess she's about six now. Um, when she was two, she was struck with a brain tumor, uh, had to go to hospital, uh, underwent, I think, a, many, many surgeries and about six months of radiation therapy. And she was having trouble using a pen and paper after that. She just couldn't hold the stylus. She couldn't really, really take into that. But she loved tracing things on the iPad with her finger. Her father, Sean, who was trying to get her to reclaim these lost linguistic skills, thought there must be something in the app store that does that. She can relearn the alphabet doing the tracing thing. It didn't exist. So he invented it. He uh, created something called the Share My ABCs app. And it's really nice because it's simple. It's so simple. You know, has this sort of phonetic clue on it. She goes in, she traces the letter. The letter gets turned into text. The text can be put into words and phrases. Output is an email, and she can let her grandparents know how she's doing. Today, the Share My ABCs platform has been translated in, I believe, somewhere between eight and 12 languages, is used in special education programs throughout the world. For his effort, Mr. Connolly gets 25% of the royalties. It is nice. This is my friend. Where is my friend? There is my friend. This is my friend Lisa Domican out of County Wicklow, just south of Dublin, with her daughter Grace, who I believe is about to approach her 15th birthday. Um, Grace is severely autistic. Anyone here work with, with kids in the spectrum at all? Any experience with that? It's, it's, it's interesting, right? Because uh, uh, it really is a spectrum, quite literally. Um, and sometimes those who aren't familiar with kids you know, living with that they'll see the kid have a, a tantrum or something. They'll think, oh, that's the disorder doing that. It really isn't. It's more frustration. The child wants something and can't properly convey it. Or the child is trying to get something across and can't, and, you know, it's, just, it's just, they're just frustrated. Um, Lisa told me once that you can always tell a mother of a spectrum child because she has one black eye and bite marks on her arms. So um, what, Mary, what many parents do, and Lisa did this, um, they start collecting photographs and they put them into binders. And you go through the binder and the child says, I want to cook, or I want to ride my bike, or I want to use a lavatory, I want to get out of here, or something like that, right? Uh, the problem is that when you get to be Grace's age, these binders get really big and really thick. And that's why they carry on these backpacks all the time, because they have to go around and you got to pull out the right binder to get the right thing. Well, one time in Dublin, in a department store, uh, Grace had a, just a five points meltdown, just absolutely just, just so. And Lisa, they got her calmed down. Lisa goes outside and she looks across the street and she sees a bus. And on the side of a bus was an advertisement for the iPhone. And she said, hold on a second, that thing holds photos and has a camera. <laughs> Why am I carrying all these stupid binders? So she worked with a Silicon Valley developer and created the Grace app for autism. And what I love about this is that it's not just, okay, well, here's the technology, there you go, have fun, now everything's all better now, right? That's not really the way these things work. Lisa forces everyone who uses this with her daughter to sign a social contract. I mean, it's literally a contract, saying that when you use this, it's about um, helping Grace not understand how to ask for things or when to ask for things, but taking advantage of those teachable moments to reinforce those etiquette skills that often get lost with kids in the spectrum. This is Adam Jershko. I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly. Um, he is a hearing, uh, hard of hearing person in um, San Francisco. Um, and he had noticed that with all the news websites, they all use video and hardly any of them are captioned. And he found this to be a disgrace properly. So he developed a social media uh, program or you know, a movement called Caption This. I'm gonna show you a one minute video um, with him conveying his frustration. There's no sound, for obvious reasons. Here it is.
I always like showing that because it's almost like a forced silence and you become very aware of the ambient noise around you and it's almost like that John Cage piece where you just sort of sit and listen for four minutes and 33, you know, or four hours, four, four minutes, 33 seconds. So I speak of anachronistic music, so. Um, this is VizWiz. Um, many people I know who are blind are very capable. They live very fulfilling, independent lives. They do just fine. There are still some things that create challenges for them. Um, for example, they may set their oven to a certain temperature and not quite know where the dial is set. Or they may find a can or pantry and think like, what, what, what was this again? What did I buy here? Or they may pull you know, a dollar bill out of their wallet and not sure what it is. So what VizWiz does, this was developed by researchers at the University of Rochester, is it's an app where the person can take a photo and upload it to the cloud and then very quickly, within like seconds or minutes, um, a trusted group of sighted users will respond and say, your oven's set at 425, uh, that's a can of goya beans, that's a $20 bill. Now, last summer, no, wrong, this past summer, last, this, I don't know what the difference is. Uh, I was in Chicago in the summer, and uh, they said, I was speaking at the World Future Society, and they said, you have to make a prediction. And I said, okay, like, well, why? And they said, because it's the World Future Society, make a prediction. I said, all right, so I made a prediction. You know, I was talking about Google Glass earlier, and I said, okay, so I think someday we're gonna see something like VizWiz for the Google Glass platform. You know, maybe within, well, how long? I don't know, six to eight months or so. It took eight days. <laughs> eight days later, I read about something called Dapper Vision, which is exactly what I described. It's basically VizWiz for the Google Glass platform and works very, very well. I'll give you one more example, another video. Let me make sure I have sound here first. Oh, yes, we do. Okay, so this is a comedian in the UK um, he goes by the name of Lost Voice Guy. He has cerebral palsy, and he does an app that he created to do his act. It's about two minutes long. I'll show it to you now. Simply walking down the street is a challenge for Lee Ridley. He's lived with cerebral palsy since birth and is unable to speak. He uses a voice synthesizer to communicate. But Lee has learned to laugh in the face of adversity, and he's making other people chuckle along with him. He's taken to stand-up comedy, performing as Lost Voice Guy. And tonight's a big night. It's his first paid booking, and he's playing to a packed house in the British capital. Thank you for that lovely welcome. I haven't felt this important since the doctors said I was going to be a special child. <laughs> when I realized I'd never be able to talk again, I was speechless. <laughs> People have often asked me why I want to put myself in a position where everyone can stare and laugh at me. The truth is that it happens to me every day anyway. At least this way there's a scheduled time and place for it. I am not related to Stephen Hawking in any way. However, I do hate the way people take the f*** of the way he speaks. I can really synthesize with him. I hope you enjoy the rest of your night. Goodbye. I've always believed that any subject can be joked about if handled correctly. I think I can get away with more because it's essentially about me. I'd like to think the audience go away with a more positive view on disability. Okay, so some practical, you know, how do we take this niche construction idea and elevate it to things that are actually within our world here? So um, this is the Bloorview Highland Rehabilitation Hospital in Toronto, and I've visited there a couple times. Um, they have an innovation lab right on the fourth floor. It's a hospital devoted mostly to kids with disabilities. And it's, the lab is run by Dr. Tom Chow, and he is who I want to be when I grow up because he's just so nice, he's so smart, he's just so brilliant, and I'm... I walk in, you know, looking like this and saying stuff I do, and I just think, oh, time, he's just so smooth. And what I love about, you know, they have this waiting room. It's, I'm kind of gushing here, but it's, I just remember this, like, it was so cool. Um, there was a, a carpet. There's no magazines or anything like that. It's just a long carpet with these tiles. And on the wall is a, is a big screen. And as you step on a tile, there's this design that shows up on the screen. And then you step a couple more times, and then there's a more designs and you're kind of hopping around and there's this kaleidoscope and then they come out and they say, Mr. Smith, Dr. Chow will see you now and you're thinking, I'm having a good time, I'm not ready to go yet, and that's okay. Uh, but it's really interesting. And they've taken this idea now and they've 
brought it into long-term care facilities. I, I don't know how, how many of you are old enough to remember this commercial, but remember the I fall and I can't get up, that really awful, that was, you know, and the idea that you have a panic button and someone falls and they can't get up, they hit the panic button, sends a note off to a first responder who comes by. Those don't work if you're unconscious. You know, it's kind of a minimum requirement, right? So they have these carpets now that can measure when you have a sort of a human-shaped mass laying immobile on the floor for, say, 10 to 20 minutes. After the first 10 minutes, it sends a note off to a nearby relative or a friend, and after, say, 20 minutes, they get emergency people involved to check up on you. So that's cool. Um, they're also doing things in the area of assistive devices. This is called the Hummer switch. Um, it's a choker that goes on the neck of a child who has a disability that prevents her from speaking. And it, you don't need to make a sound. You just go, hmm, hmm, like that. It reads the vocal, you know, kind of the vibration of the folds, and it activates a, uh, a speech synthesizer. And they're doing really, like, kind of really interesting, crazy stuff in the area of cognitive computing, right? You know, they have these sort of makeshift things they can put on your head. Uh, and, and they actually now have elevated it to things you can actually implant in, you know, it, under the skin of where the head is. I mean, it, you know, have you heard about this thing with electrocardiographic implants? And, you know, the, you know, when I decide to move my arm like this, the white matter of my brain is sending an ion package to there. And in order for the, the action to move that quickly, I have to discharge ions. And if I capture that ion with a piece of brass, I can control cybernetic body parts. I can take something and literally plug it into the back of my head and control an arm doing this. And I start to think, man, technology's moving fast. Technology's getting weird, you know? Because it's, it's just, when do we start getting into the whole cyborg thing? That's, that's, you know? And then I read a story about this woman, Kathy Hutchinson, who's 59 years old, quadriplegic, using this very same brain gate technology to take a sip of water unassisted for the first time in 17 years. That's not the face of a cyborg. That's the face of somebody who finally feels human for the first time in a really long time. And then I'm back. I get, okay, I'm, we're back on, on point here. And my friend Carl Groves, who's a really good accessibility um, professional, told me, he goes, we were having this discussion, and I, he said, look, uh, it's really about this. It's, it's about providing you know, removing those barriers that separate people from fundamental human needs. It's not bolt-ons, it's not, you know, lists of things you gotta do, it's not this mandates, you know, it's about, you're trying to remove the barriers. It's fundamental stuff that makes us feel human, that makes us feel alive. A Couple examples, then we'll wrap up. So, this is a map of all the areas in the United States where access to healthy, affordable food is logistically or economically impossible. If you have a disability, you are 33% more likely to be food insecure and suffer from health and nutrition problems. Probably because you live too close to relatively unhealthy sources of nutrition. This great urban farm in Baltimore called Real Food Farm, they took a six acre plot of land, cultivated it over a period of time, because you can't just walk into a parking lot and start growing things, there's things you gotta do, there's pH balances and stuff. And they take their crops and they put them on these trucks and drive them right into the cities. And they sell everything there. This past year, they launched a mobile app and they increased food distribution by 580%. It's nice, nice story. Sometimes the human need is just to connect with somebody, just to let someone know, I'm doing okay and I hope you are too. Chad Rubel, his mother, uh, suffers from aphasia and she is not able to use a computer keyboard. So he took a connect and rewired it and created a little program for it that allows her to send emails just using gestures, just using her hands. And it's very simple and it works. And it's not about the technology, it's about letting someone know like, hey, I'm connecting with you, I'm still here, I'm still around. People get frustrated though. Um, this is Dana Florence and her husband. All three of their kids have cerebral palsy, all of them. So she formed a group called 3 to b in Ontario which provides support to parents uh, of kids with disabilities. And I saw her speak and one of her directors, uh, Brenda Agnew said, you know, I don't harbor any illusion that my child with a disability is gonna grow up to run a marathon or be in the Olympics or win a Nobel Prize or something like that. I just want my child to be a productive taxpayer. Can I have that? This is Mason Ellsworth. He is 20, 
24 years old. I think that's right, 23 perhaps. Lives in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. He is a former music prodigy. Um, at the age of 18, he could play six instruments fluently, sang, played in three bands as well, his local, well as his local orchestra. Um, in July of 2008, he was all set to go to college on a full music scholarship, got into a car accident, uh, went into a six month coma with what's called a TBI, a traumatic brain injury. And they did not think he'd come back, but he did. And he's actually today doing very well. And early on, you know, the thought wasn't so much, well, how do we keep Mason alive? And once he got past that, that little, you know, kind of threshold, well, what do we do to make him not feel like a piece of furniture in the room? And how do we reactivate the muse, right? So there's these really small, simple apps out there that let anyone almost become a musician, or at least make noise like a musician, right? And, you know, there'd been some reading about what Don Cousins is doing in Chicago with kids with learning disabilities and using these apps to help them learn how to play the piano. So I thought, maybe we can do something there, right? And it's kind of created this little awakening. And, and I certainly don't want to say that the technology and the apps have led to this, but it did create a, a, something of a second career. Today, Mason is a designer. And he creates greeting cards and posters, and he sells them and does reasonably well. And last December, he was able to stand up in a walking brace for the first time ever and do his work. And they use these as incentives. It reinforces the, the rehab that he has to go through in order to get to this point. He's become a productive taxpayer. The family have let me show you a video. It's very short, it's about a minute long. Um, keep in mind when you watch this, this is a young man who six months earlier had no use of his hands and couldn't speak. One being the idea of competence. You know, there's, there's always a thought that we have people with disabilities and people without. That's not really the way biology and science works. It's, you know, we're all good at some things and not so good at others, right? So if we think of competence as, say, a spectrum, no pun intended, of how we adapt to our situation, our environment, you know, it creates a more inclusive approach to accessibility than just you have to do this for these people over here who are not like you. Affordance. Hopefully I'm using this correctly. <laughs> so, so I think I am. Because I like the idea of affordance being a relationship. And part of the relationship is making it implicitly clear how you're supposed to interact with it. Right? I, I do see that as sort of a, an exchange. Right? And some of these tools work really well because they are very simple. You just put them on and they work. Or you just try it out and it works. Incentive. You know, this, this comes up a lot in healthcare. How do we create incentives? We put a Fitbit on and then we did it. You know, and I look at it from a slightly different angle, which is, you know, what we're really trying to do is help people become better versions of what they already are, no matter where they start. And it doesn't mean that someone's trying to be here and they're trying to do this. Or just, everyone's trying to sort of, like I said before, find their own level a little bit. And finally, empathy. What, is, what really is empathy? How do we, is, is it pity? Oh, the poor disabled people. No, I, I've, I've never met someone with a disability who, likes being thought of like that. I just don't, I don't see that. I see empathy as allowing for attributes that they know cannot be changed. I think the best way to put it is to read you this bit by Dr. Michael Graves. Um, uh, he, is a, he runs his own line of, of medical devices and he's a former architect. At the age of 68, he went into the hospital with sinus infection and came out a paraplegic. This could happen to any one of us. It could happen to any of us. And so he, I, I'm gonna read you this from his blog. We talk about the first day he realized his life had changed. Early on, my first day out of bed at Kessler Hospital, I went into the bathroom in my wheelchair to shave. I looked in the mirror, and the bottom of it was at the height of my forehead. I couldn't see my face, so there was no shaving with a straight razor. An electric razor was brought to me, and I tried to plug it in, and it was out of reach. And I thought, well, at least I can wash my face, but I couldn't reach the faucet. So the next day, my surgeon came by. I asked him to get in my wheelchair. I strapped him in, and he couldn't reach anything. I asked, who designed this? And he said, experts. <laughs> so 
the lesson we take here is as we go forward, you know, start thinking of ways we might be able to look, look at accessibility as an opportunity for innovation. Not a list of things that degrade other benefits, but just one more that's added into the space. Designing for the extremes really does force people to innovate. And there's people out there who've been doing it almost their entire lives. So do think of Iris, think of Kathy, think of Adam, think of Lisa and Grace. Think of Lost Voice Guy and Dana and her family. Think of Dr. Graves. Think of my grandmother, Chad Rubel's mother. Think of Mason. And yes, think of Alice Cooper too. He, he needs your help as well. <laughs> because the reality is that all of us at some point or another reach that, that, that threshold, that precipice, where the technology has moved just a little beyond what we're comfortable with. So, you know, remember that graph? You know, we're going to be in that graph sooner or later. And that's the way it's always been. Oh, we're clapping already. It's very sad when you're in that graph, <laughs> but thank you. So, so, whether we're talking about the first prosthetic hand developed in the 1600s or, you know, that science fiction reality that we're, the technology's infusing our bodies, right? That it's here. That time is here now. It's not the future. I'll leave you with the obligatory uh, William Gibson quote, the future has already arrived. It's just not evenly distributed yet. But you're going to help with that. I know you are. My name is Kel Smith. My company is called Anikto. It's the Greek word for open. Um, it's been around for six years, and I basically do stuff like what I just described in varying ways. And like I said before, or uh, as Joe mentioned, um, I do have a book by Morgan Kaufman called Digital Outcast, if you're interested in this. I have a couple copies with me if they've arrived today, which I think they did. Um, I don't know. I think the book is good. People tell me it is, and they can't all be wrong. Um, but anyway, I've talked enough. I would love to hear your questions or thoughts if we have some time. I think we have a little bit of time here, so um, time's yours. Would Do they run around with the mics? Okay, I think we have we have a gentleman over here and gentleman down here. That's everything I know, by the way. So if you ask me something, I may just say I don't know. <laughs> I don't I don't know much. That was wonderful. Um, I do have a question because I've always um, been an advocate for bringing awareness um, to my clients about you know, making their sites uh, accessible. Mm -hmm. And there was a time when I was able to kind of leverage um, certain realities, like there had been a lawsuit against, now you can, you, you can tell me, I can't remember if it was Target or was some yeah. big Target, store, yeah. Yeah. Um, because their site was not accessible. Mm -hmm. Um, but over time, I haven't seen evidence of, of that kind of legal requirement. The only legal requirement is, um, you know, for federal government sites to be accessible. So can you comment on that? And what kind of leverage could we have, you know, in terms of, well, look, you have to do it or you could be liable? Yeah, um, that's a great question. It's chapter four. <laughs> you know, it's, I'm, not, I'm honestly not chilling. I mean, it, it's almost its own presentation, so that's a total cop-out answer. But you bring up a very interesting point, which is that the private sector is not beholden to the same laws and mandates that, say, the government is. And I would also add that those mandates don't necessarily work for the government as well, because you could have a website, for example, that's Section 5A compliant, but still fails what we might call fairly fundamental usability tests. And, and I've seen people who are blind completely get lost on, on these sites, even though they may technically comply. So it comes down first to our definition of what's proper compliance, and then how do you, I think the second part of your question is sort of, how do we get someone to kind of buy in? What I don't like, and this is just a, a Kel Smith opinion, is saying the, you better, or you're gonna get this, because it's very, very rare. Um, because I, I remember I, I worked for the, um, the American Law Institute back then, um, and I covered that case for a couple years. And I wrongly thought and predicted that you're going to see a whole host, a whole constellation of big tame, you know, re retailers, Home Depot and Best Buy, all getting on board with this, and they haven't. And some are better than others, and some make it a priority and some don't, and some make it a priority because they have to, and some make it a priority because they want to. So you're always going to have these different sort of levels of what we call compliance. And I guess the, the, my point, and I think I have one, which is coming up here, is that there's no like base like threshold where you go, yep, yeah, it's accessible. Congratulations. Little gold star. Because it, you know, what do we, for whom? 
because as we, call, as we saw, like the whole range of what we call ability covers a lot of nuances. So just, if you have so many nuances, there's no point you say, yep, it's accessible now, now that you've done this. You, for, what are your websites that you could go to to have it checked? Oh yeah, there still are. Technically, yes, and you can go to say WebAIM, which is I think the best one. There's one from the University of um, Illinois, and there's um, used to be one Cynthia says, and Bobby was the one many a long time ago. You know, and I think those are starting points, because I think the only way you really, really know is you put it in front of somebody who has a disability. You say, now try to do something, and they say, I can't do this and this and this, and they say, yeah, but it's accessible. Like, well, obviously it's not because I can't do things. So. I didn't answer your question, did I? <laughs> uh, yes. So you started with the CAPTCHA example. Have you found CAPTCHAs that you like in the accessibility realm? No. Or an, or, or an alternative to them that? Yes, yes. Um, I, I think the, there's the honeypot, which works pretty well, which, which people support. And my friend Carl really likes that one. Um, I like the little, little quiz that they give you. Like, it's kind of like, um, prove you're not a robot. So which one of these things can you eat, books, dirt, or apples, you know, or which is hot, fire or ice, you know, just things like that, because it requires a little bit of cognitive processing to get that through. So um, there's no, there's nothing that's 100% foolproof for everything, but I found that to be pretty good. Um, the audio captures, they, they, to their other question, they have their own, some are pretty good, and other ones, like I heard one audio capture through a screen reader once through NVDA, and it was just like, <laughs> and it was like, <laughs> that's, that's very clear. <laughs> so, so. All right, well, I, th I think we're at the end uh, for this presentation, so feel free to catch Kelly after this, then we're gonna have a 20 minute break, and then we're splitting up into the three rooms. So uh, thank you, Cal, very much. Uh, cheers, thank you.